Hello, everybody, and welcome to Box Seed Banter. I'm your host, Billy Ballas, a high school baseball coach of over 10 years, someone who's been around baseball my whole life, and I'm broadcasting today from the park at the park in Petco Park in San Diego because I'm talking about the Padres, and joining me to discuss the San Diego Padres is Chris Heilman. Now, Chris played baseball through high school. He got an engineering degree from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and a PhD in biomedical engineering at Case Western. He willingly left Southern California to spend some time in Cleveland before eventually returning back to Southern California. He's now on the Central Coast as a professor at Cal Poly, and he's very well-rounded. Not only is he an athlete, is he a scholar in academia, a PhD. He's also an Eagle Scout, and he is a a very avid Padres fan. He attended both World Series that the Padres participated in, 1984 and 1998. So that's his claim to fame as a Padre fan. I think the, the 84 World Series was before he was born, but he was in his mother's womb. That's right. uh, Yeah. So Chris, welcome to the program. Very excited. Very glad to have you here today. Thanks. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. I had that obstructed view seat for the 84 votes here. (laughs) Now we are talking about the San Diego Padres and they began play back in 1969. They're part of that expansion that also brought the Montreal Expos, the Seattle Pilots, and the Kansas City Royals. And the Montreal Expos, as we discussed a few weeks ago, moved to Washington, D.C. to become the Nationals. And the Pilots only lasted one year in Seattle before moving to Milwaukee. So, you know, two out of these four teams are no longer in their original locations, but the Padres are there. And... They are one of two California teams. There are five teams in California, Padres, Dodgers, Angels, Giants, A's. The Padres, along with the Angels, are the only two teams that have originated in California. The Giants and Dodgers both moved to California from New York uh, for the 1958 season, and the A's... Uh, began playing in Philadelphia, then moved to Kansas City, then finally found a home in Oakland. And the Padres, they don't have much competition for fans down in San Diego, do they, Chris? They don't. We used to have other sports teams. <laughs> yeah, the, the Clippers were originally in San Diego right. before moving to L.A., and then the Chargers uh, recently moved to L.A. to follow in the yeah. Clippers' footsteps. Fresh wound. <laughs> Both the both the Clippers and Chargers are kind of second fiddle in L.A. at the moment. They are, yeah. L.A. just sucks up all our teams. <laughs> and so that leaves the Padres as, uh, you know, the only professional team in the city of San Diego. And they are the only Major League Baseball team that is the only major pro sports team that's out of the four major sports, baseball, football, basketball, and hockey. Um they're the only Major League Baseball team that is the only pro sports team in their city. Interesting. I did not know that. Yeah. And <laughs> also talking about only Major League Baseball teams, they're the only team that has not thrown a no-hitter. That's right. And for a little while, we were the only team that didn't have a no-hitter or someone to hit for the cycle. Oh, ah, well, don't you, recent that yeah. we finally got a cycle in there. Oh, well, that knowledge may come in handy in, in a few moments. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were named after, do you know where the Padres got their name? Yeah, the, the Franciscan Friars, the, the guys who made the missions in California. That's true, but do you know how the, because um, they're named actually after the San Diego Padres of the Pacific Coast League. Oh. 
It's nice. similar, similar to how the Angels got their name because there's also the LA Angels of the PCL. There was the San Diego Padres of the PCL and a famous San Diego native played for those Padres. Any idea on who that could be? This was back in like the 30s. The, the Pacific Coast League Padres? Yeah. Um, oh, oh, it's a Ted Williams? Yes, Ted Williams yeah. played for them way back when. Our native son. <laughs> and and uh, so, yeah, the Padres, though, the Major League Baseball team in 1969, and they were named after those Padres of the PCL. They've played in Qualcomm Stadium, which was originally San Diego Stadium and then Jack Murphy Stadium before being renamed to Qualcomm. They played there from 1969 to 03. And then they built beautiful Petco Park, and they've been in Petco since 04. Uh, now, Chris, you've been to games at both stadiums, right? What are your thoughts on, on each of those? Well, Petco is fantastic. It's arguably the best stadium in baseball. Um, Certainly some of the best food in baseball. I think we've had this discussion um, that you come down to it and you, you lovingly refer to it as Dodger Park South, <laughs> but, um, Dodger Stadium South. But uh, the food is much superior to Dodger Stadium. Um, yeah, so it's bright, shiny, and new. It's your kind of, you kind of had that first wave of downtown ballparks. I think of like the Indians Park and like Baltimore mm -hmm. and then, this is kind of that second generation that kind of learned from the, the mistakes of those. And <laughs> it really, I think it's one of the best parks in baseball. Um, Qualcomm, you know, it, it managed to drive out two professional sports teams, <laughs> both the Padres and then the Chargers. Um, and I think I recently heard that they're going to level it and build a brand new stadium in its place because the Aztecs don't even want to play in it. <laughs> so um, yeah, it was, it was fun because it has memories and there's something about having a football stadium that you play baseball in when you get to playoff time and you can actually fill a football stadium with baseball fans. It's a cool scene, but most of the year it just feels cavernous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I agree with you on Petco. Petco is a beautiful stadium, great location. I mean, you're in San Diego, so the weather's going to be great. And it's a, yeah, you, you stay in gas lamp down, down there and, you walk to the stadium, it's a nice day, plenty of great food choices. Uh, the only problem occasionally has been the product on the field. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and now looking out onto the field, the Padres recently, they, they went back to the roots with the brown and yellow. What are your thoughts Nothing. on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we'll get back to that uniform discussions a little later on in the program, but I do want to point out that they're the only team, again, Padres is the only major league baseball team that does not have a road uniform in the traditional gray. Hmm. Yeah, I guess we're, what are they? They're technically sand. Yeah. 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 So they went back to their roots in the, in the brown and yellow and their road uniform is that, that sand set. Now in the past 25 years the the Padres have a few division titles winning in 96 and 98 and then again in 05 and 06 that 05 team I mean they won the West the West was a down year that year 82 and 80 was what it <laughs> took to win the West yeah. and then in the NLDS the Padres got swept I mean not exactly surprising considering they were in the playoffs at 82 and 80 so they finished 82 and 83 um <laughs> one of i don't know if they're the only or one of the few postseason teams to actually finish below 500 and then in 07 they lost in a one game tiebreaker with the rockies which we're all still waiting for matt holiday to touch home plate oh man that is that is a bitter spot in my memory of the Padres. I mean, it was so clear. I mean, that, that was one of the justifications in my mind for instant replay. Right yes. There. Yeah, that's a great point. And they, the Padres do not have any wild card appearances. Um, they do have two NL pennants, as we discussed. You were at both of those World Series in 84 and 98, but they came up short in both of those no uh, World Series titles for San Diego, but you know, are they going to break that streak sometime soon in the next ten years? 
hopefully we've got an exciting new crew happening right now it's they're fun to watch i think we might be on the upswing here all right well i'm looking forward to talking about the padres with you chris now chris last week on the show we talked about the cardinals and the cardinals trivia question were who were the two World Series MVPs in their two World Series wins in the past quarter century? That was in 06 and 2011. Do you have a a guess on either of those who may have won the World Series MVP in in those World Series? Um, Was David Freeze one of them? Freeze was, and I'm kind of surprised you got that one because you had a lot going on during that World Series. (laughs) That was, yeah, I think... Game seven was your rehearsal. Yeah. You guys were all watching the game instead of paying attention. <laughs> well, we, we figured it out, and you, you still got married. So <laughs> I true. think it, everything was fine. Uh, so, yes, David Freeze in 2011 was the World Series MVP. He had that triple in the bottom of the ninth in game six that tied the game, and then he walked it off with a home run uh, to send it into game seven. Um, so yeah, Freeze was a World Series MVP in 2011. Do you know who was a World Series MVP in 06? No idea. David Eckstein. Eckstein, nice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that brings us to this week's trivia question about the Padres. It's actually something that you just mentioned a moment ago uh, is, is regarding hitting for the cycle. So the Padres have had two players who have hit for the cycle in their history. And as you mentioned, they had nobody for a while until fairly recently. So do you know who the two players to hit for the cycle are? I do. Okay. Uh, so you want to share with the group? Um, why don't you share one of them and, and we'll leave it open for, the, for everyone else to try to name the second one. All right. One of them was Matt Kemp. Okay, that's correct. I will confirm that we do have a correct answer there. Um, And the other one, we will leave it open for you. If you have any guesses, you know, send them out there on Twitter or Instagram at Boxy Banter. Um, I will say that Matt Kemp did his at Coors Field, and so did this other player. Mm, Interesting. I don't know if I ever connected that. (laughs) Now, the Padres, now normally I I stick with the past 25 years talking about the owners, but one of the owners um, prior to that is pretty interesting. They were owned by Ray Kroc, he of the McDonald's fame, uh, from 1974 until his death in 84. He died before the season in 84, so he was unable to witness their pennant winning year in 84. Then when he passed, uh, his wife, Joan, was the owner of the team, and she owned the team until 1990. She actually, Chris, I don't know if you know this, she tried to donate the team to the city of San Diego. I did know that. That's a really cool tidbit. And it reminds me of kind of like the Green Bay Packers. Exactly, like yeah. Publicly owned franchise. <laughs> but didn't... Major League Baseball like didn't allow it, right? Correct. Yeah, the MLB rules forbid public ownership, and yeah, it's that's exactly what I thought of the Green Bay Packers when I came across that. So yeah, unfortunately, that would have been really cool, but unfortunately, that was not the case. Do you know uh, why? Was that like uh, because they had revenue sharing at the time, and that would throw that off? Or yeah, I'm not looking? sure. Yeah, okay. but I know that you know uh, MLB is very particular in their owners and everything um but that was not so she then sold the team to tom werner from and he owned the team from 90 to 94 he currently is the owner of the uh red sox um so he got to start in the major league baseball with the padres then he sold the team to john moores who owned it from 94 to 2012 and then eventually he sold the team to Ron Fowler, who is the current owner. And that sale took place in 2012. And some other people involved um, in Fowler's ownership group are some members of the O'Malley family, the former owners of the Dodgers. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the owners. Um, and I think one of the – at one point early on in the Padres – I think before Croc bought the team, 
they were, th there was a sale and the new owner was going to move the team to Washington, to DC. Uh, mm -hmm. But that sale, so that sale fell through and then Croc bought the team and then he kept it in San Diego. Then looking at their general managers, they've had uh, a, one of them, a fairly long tenured general manager. It started with Randy Smith, who was the GM from 93 to 95. Then Kevin Towers, a long time GM from 96 to oh, or yeah, 96 to 09. I mean, quite a long lifespan for a general manager there. He was at the helm for the pennant winning team in 98, as well as the two division winning teams in 05 and 06. So it seems like he, he was pretty successful there in San Diego, right, Chris? Yeah, I always liked Kevin Towers. I mean, he was kind of, in my mind, the general manager of my whole childhood. And, uh, yeah, he was the one who took us to the World Series in 98, um, a couple of division titles, and he seemed to be an intelligent baseball guy, make some good moves. And then since then, we haven't had quite the same until we've had Preller. Preller's kind of an oddball, but I'm sure you'll talk about him. <laughs> but he's made some interesting moves, but I think we're moving in the right direction. Yeah, so after Towers, Jed Hoyer was the GM from 09 to 2011. And then Jed Hoyer moved on to Boston and then to Chicago with the Cubs under, um, under Theo Epstein. So, yeah, he, you know, a guy, I don't know, had a bright future ahead of him. I don't know what happened there in San Diego. Um, Josh Burns was there for a few years in 2012 to 2014. And Josh Burns is currently um, in the front office with the Dodgers right now. And then, as you mentioned, A.J. Preller from 2014. He's the current GM, so he's been there since 2014. He, as you said, he's made some interesting moves, both good and bad. What were some of the ones that you would like back, and what were some of the steals that he made that you remember? Yeah, well, talking recent history, I mean – these gigantic contracts that he put together for Hosmer and Myers. I mean, they're good players, but they seem pretty disproportionate. <laughs> um, I mean, this year they've been playing great, but they kind of struggled out of the gate and made him not look so great with these big dollar deals he put together. Um, we kind of won the Machado sweepstakes, which was interesting. There's a lot of big, big potential contracts out there at the time. Um, I like him. I think some people could go either way with him. But uh, yeah, I think as far as his, his, his ability on the field, it's unquestioned. You know, his, yeah. he's, he's great defensively. The throws that he makes are incredible. Oh, yeah. And They're he can insane. mash. Yeah, he can mash. Underhanded flips running the wrong way right on the money. It's great. I love it. But yeah, and he kind of always had a little bit of a, a PR problem. It seems like he's making a concerted effort to clean it up in San Diego, though, and I think he's done a good job so far. And then I think the biggest move that Preller made was after he signed James Shields, which may not have been the best signing, he then just... flipped him to, was it Toronto? and No, Chicago, the White Sox. Yeah. Wasn't that part of like a three-team deal? Uh, I'm not sure, but he, he traded him to the White Sox for Fernando Tatis Jr. Ah, yes. And <laughs> I mean that. that well. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. they've he's he, our, our bright shining hope. These days. <laughs> yeah, he's part of that bright future that you alluded to earlier. So yeah, he he's made because I know before I forget what year it was. You know, everyone was anointing the Padres as the winner of the offseason. They had to deal with the Dodgers trading for Matt Kemp. They mm -hmm. made some splashy signings, and then everything kind of fizzled. But, yeah, now they, they've got some great young talent that he has assembled, and we'll see if that can now flip the script there in San Diego. Now let's look at some of their managers, and I'll have a, a little tidbit about them. See if you can identify the manager from this fact. I'll start with okay. somebody who participated in all five postseason appearances. And he's also the first foreign-born manager to reach the World Series. 
all five postseason appearances. So it's yeah, uh, eighty four. Yeah. as well as uh, 96, 98, uh, 05, and 06. Is it Bochi? It is, yeah. He was a backup uh, catcher. Manager. Yeah. Backup catcher on 84, and then, yeah, the manager from 95 to 06. So he was the manager of all of their more recent postseason appearances. And their next manager was one of three, the other two being Tommy Lasorda and Larry Durker, former pitchers to win the manager of the year award um but black correct yeah Thanks. usually usually you don't see pitchers turning out to be great managers uh, a lot of times it's catchers as, as we saw there with boshi and you know sometimes infielders occasionally outfielders but pitchers very rarely as we see just three have one manager of the year but bud black has been a fairly successful manager he was manager there in san diego from 07 to 2015 then we had somebody who coached arizona state to the college world series four times hmm. so as a collegiate coach he took arizona state to Omaha four different times. I have no idea. That's Pat Murphy. Okay. So he was the manager in 2015. I think Black got fired early on. And then Murphy was the manager. This next guy was his high school's valedictorian in Kentucky. And he went to the University of Kentucky where he graduated with a BA in finance. And he was a uh, summa cum laude with a 3.89 GPA at Kentucky. Wow. Impressive Andy, line. Yeah. I have no idea. Maybe AJ Green? Andy Green. Andy Green? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where AJ came from. <laughs> and their current manager was an assistant GM in Texas at one point. Um... Forgot his name. <laughs> what is it? Jace Tingler. Jace Tingler, that's right. And the first name is Jace Tingler. No, he's not Jace Tingler. It's Jace Tingler. So yeah, that, that's their managers. What are your thoughts on on their managers? And they've they've had some, you know, both <laughs> they, they love those those BB managers with uh, Boshi and Bud Black. Um, and then both of those guys went on to other National League West teams. Uh, but yeah, so what are your thoughts on the managers? Yeah, I mean, we haven't had a real strong continuity of leadership. It seems like we turn them over a lot, um, especially in recent days. Bochi was, I think, probably our most steadfast manager, mm -hmm. kind of led us through some ups and downs. Um, it's also nice that he had the history with the Padres too, being mm -hmm. a player there. Um, actually like, even though I couldn't remember his name, Jace Tingler, <laughs> he seems to be decent. I mean, we're only 20, 30 games into his tenure here, but I'm liking him so far. I think he's doing a good job managing all these personalities we have. But um, yeah, Bud Black was okay, I think. You know, even though he got that nod for manager of the year, I think it was kind of dull and not real exciting as a fan, but he got the job done. It's kind of funny, though, because he got manager of the year in 2010, and that was when the Padres kind of collapsed in September. <laughs> yeah. But they weren't supposed to do much that year, I don't think, which is right. why he got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so... Do you do you guys feel because there's another manager in the National League West who got to start coaching in San Diego, and that's Dave Roberts, who I think when when Bud Black was let go in 2015, they didn't even interview Roberts, who was the, the bench coach in San Diego at the time. Uh, do Padre fans feel like that was a missed opportunity? Potentially, I mean, we see that he's gone on to great things with the Dodgers, but. You know, I don't know if he was heir to the throne or anything like that. I don't think at the time it seemed like a missed opportunity in hindsight, definitely. But 
Yeah. I mean, it helps to have the the roster that the Dodgers have had recently. I mean, that's definitely been a product of his success in LA. But True. you know, he he has shown to to you know get a lot of that out of his players. But yeah, Jace Tingler might be that guy in San Diego right now. Let's look at the roster that I've created for the Padres. Now, quick reminder for everyone. I'm going back 25 years, so we're starting in 1995. Pick one player per year, cannot repeat players, and you must form a coherent roster. So we'll start at the catching position. I took Nick Hunley in 2011. He had, uh, you know, not a lot of pop, but he, he only – Played, he only had, you know, 280 at-bats, but he hit 280. He was worth three wins, uh, so he, he made the most out of it when he played that year. Uh, at first base, there's really only one choice for first base in San Diego, right? Yeah, Adrian Gonzalez. Adrian Gonzalez, and I got him in 09. He was 40 home runs, which there in Petco – is impressive. I know they've moved some of the fences in recently. This was before they did any of that. 40 home runs led the league with 119 walks, uh, had an on base of over 400. Uh, he was an all star and a gold glover that year. Um, at second base, Mark Loretta from 04. Oh, yeah. Do you have some on Adrian? Yeah, just real quick. I also wanted to add that he was, it was fun because he was a homegrown talent. He went to high school in San Diego. He was, he, yeah. He was Lake High School. So it's nice to see him come come to fruition at the Padres, too. And he was a, a number one overall pick, but not for the Padres, actually. Who did yeah. he get picked by? Uh, I forget if it was um, the, the uh, Marlins or the Rangers. I want to say the Marlins. Um, yeah, he was the first pick of the Marlins. And then, yeah, he eventually got uh, traded to San Diego. And, yeah, the local boy. It's always nice seeing, seeing the local boy. Uh, you know, come through for that for the local team. Uh, then at second base, Mark Loretta in 04 hit 335 that year. Uh, also led the league in sack flies with 16. Um, yeah, he Loretta is just one of those professional hitters. Moving across the diamond at third base, we got a switch hitter, Ken Caminiti. Uh, he was worth 7.6 wins that year. He was the MVP. He was an all-star gold glover and a silver slugger. Uh, hit 40 home runs. Drove in 130. Triple slash line of 326, 408, 621. OPS of over 1,000. Uh, so monster year from the third baseman, Caminiti, that year. And you're like, what, you know, 10, 11 years old that year? Were you a big Caminiti yeah. fan? Oh, yeah. He was just, like, dripping in mythology and lore. I mean, he was, like, a god in a little kid's eyes, you know. He had this, like, biker appearance, and he just mashed the ball, and he made these incredible plays at third base. He was that famous one where he dove and rolled at third base and threw from the seat of his pants right on the money, one hop over to first. Um, yeah, and then – then you come to find later when you grow up that he had all these troubles behind all that. It was kind of kind of deflating, um, but at the time it was it was fun to watch. Yeah, the the innocence of youth, right? Yes, that's right. And then now uh, talking about mythical creatures, we come to shortstop Fernando Tatis Jr. from last year, 2019. Uh, he didn't have a full season. He only had 372 plate appearances, but he made the most of them. Uh, he hit 22 home runs, uh, batting average 317, on base of 379, slugging 590. Uh, so, you know, just great numbers from him. Um, stole 16 bases, and he's got a bright future, doesn't he? Definitely. I mean, he is the future of the Padres. A lot of people say the future of baseball. I mean, he's very quickly, I think, becoming the face of baseball. This youthful exuberance, this energy. He just seems to be having fun out there and all the while just mashing and making great plays. And it's just exciting to watch. Yeah. He has a bright future and he, he, he can do it all. I know last year in 2019, his, his defense was a little erratic. Uh, 
he kind of struggled with some of the routine plays, but he's, he's kind of ironed that out this year and he's, yeah, he's been doing it all hitting bombs, uh, running the bases with reckless abandon. Yeah. He's got a cannon there as short. So absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, if we were doing this, uh, this, you know, putting a roster like this together in a few years, we're getting a monster year out of him instead of that abbreviated year last year. That's right. Yeah. I mean, even if you took this year, this shortened year, you might have a better year than last year. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Moving to the outfield, I've got Reggie Sanders from 99. He was worth 4.1 wins, uh, hit 26 home runs. So pretty good year out of him. In center field, left-hander Brian Giles in 05. Uh, he led the league in walks with 119. So great on-base percentage, hit over 300, got on base over 400 clip. Uh, not a lot of power, 15 home runs, um, stole 13 bags. Um, and then right field, Tony Gwynn. Um, I think, you know, his prime was prior to this period. Uh, so I got him in the twilight of his career there in 1997. He was worth 4.3 wins. He led the league in hits with 220. And he led the league in batting average at 372. Wow. I mean, you, yeah. you don't see many 372s anymore. Especially in the twilight of your career. <laughs> <laughs> and that was kind of a shame looking through the past 25 years, you know, the, the guys you remember as the Padres. You know, of course, Tony Gwynn is the top of that list. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, you know, his prime was 80s, early 90s. And you know, this was when they made their run in 97, 98, went to the World Series in 98. I mean, he was still one of the most productive guys in baseball 10 years after his prime. It's pretty impressive to see. Yeah, and another local boy, right? San Diego State Aztec. That's right. Two, yep. sport, two sports star in college. That's right. Yeah, he was, I think, all league in basketball, too. He was, he was a great basketball player. Yeah. Athlete. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, and as you mentioned, though, like a, he just a couple years before this in 94, I think he hit 394. That was the last real um, run at 400 in that, yep. you know, that season that was cut short. So, yeah, yep. Mr. Mr. Padre, Tony Gwynn, had to have him on this roster. As we move to the bench, we got Phil Nevin in 01. He had a, he had a solid year, 41 home runs. Um, came out of price. He struck out 147 times. But he's worth 5.8 wins, hit over 300, a lot of power there at third base and then also another third baseman uh chase headley so we're strong on third baseman on this roster yep. chase headley a switch hitter worth 6.4 wins uh 31 home runs uh he walked 86 times so decent on base percentage out of him and he was a gold glover uh, yep. in the outfield got hunter renfro from 2018 now I'm a I'm a Dodger fan and I didn't mind when they traded Hunter Renfro away because it seemed like he if he got 500 at bats against the Dodgers he'd be an MVP. <laughs> That's right. He did some damage against the Dodgers. There. He did have uh 26 home runs this year. I feel like 21 of them might have been against the Dodgers. <laughs> and I've also got Ryan Klesko in the outfield from 2000. He also hit 26 home runs. Uh, it, it solid on base out of him. He walked 91 times, um, got on base just under a 400 clip. And then rounding out the position players, that backup catcher, I've got Rene Rivera from 2014. He was worth 2.7 wins, um, 11 home runs, uh, solid defense there out of Rivera. So what do you think of this? You know, these players, I know we touched on a few of them as we went by. Is there anyone else you want to touch on out of the position players? Yeah, I think just in general, I just wanted to point out, and I put together a roster too, and I, I think it was challenging. You can tell me what your experience was, but we had a lot of concentrated talent in certain years. <laughs> That's so true. The rules of this quarter century team that we put together here and made it hard to put together a, a cogent roster with all the positions and all the years um, without leaving some great seasons behind. Um, so I just wanted to point that out because we'll get to that when we talk about who got left out later, but 
I think that was a shame. Yeah. But, um, one other thing I wanted to bring up is um, just that we had a lot of silver sluggers throughout here too. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys leading the league in hits. Um, and let's see, I'm looking at your list here. You got Mark Loretta, Ken Caminiti, Tony Gwynn, and Chase Headley. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So you might not have the big power numbers of other teams, but we had guys who got a lot of hits. Um, yeah. Pretty thin on on MVPs, um, which is not surprising. But uh, we did have that one year with Caminiti, and that was that was a fun year. Um, like I said, right in the the peak of our youth, and it was exciting <laughs> to be a part of. Yeah, it is funny that doing these rosters for every team, it seems like certain teams are like stacked at one position. You know, like you come to the mm -hmm. Cubs. And they've got like Anthony Rizzo and Mark Grace and Derek Lee. And I want to say like even somebody else at first base. Um, but they had like, yeah, you know, three or four first basemen there that were all tough to pick from. And then you come yeah. to, you know, another team, they might be stacked. And then, you know, you come to the Padres and the Padres got a depth at third base. So it's kind yeah. of funny how that happens sometimes. Yeah, I think um, it was nice that you got Tatis in there. I think if you didn't have him, we would be – woefully short at shortstop <laughs> yeah um, so even with the partial season i think he's the right pick there most recently but um yeah and a couple of these guys like uh reggie sanders and i don't know if i even associate him with the padres that much what do you have one season there yeah two? some I, yeah i associate him more with like the reds i think yeah he was kind of a, a transient padres player but he had a great year while he was there mm-hmm and like we already talked about Tony Gwynn. One thing I wanted to add about Tony Gwynn too is just, just a gem of a human being too. I mean, he was did so much for the community even after his career. And I must have had four or five things signed by Tony Gwynn. He would always stop and sign something for you. My my parents would always joke that that made his signature worth nothing because he <laughs> signed everything. But always took the time for fans. Just Just a great guy. All right, now let's move along to the pitching staff and starting with Andy Ashby from 95. Uh, only went 12 and 10, but he had a 2.94 ERA, 5.1 war, um, ERA plus of 138, so a solid year from Ashby there. Then Kevin Brown in 98, huge year, uh, 18 and 7. He was worth 9.1 wins, 18 and 7, 2.38 ERA, Led the league in, in starts with 35. You know, he threw 257 innings. Led the league in FIP at 223. And also kept the ball in the yard. Led, led the league in home runs allowed at .3 per nine. And this was on the heels of his 97 season when he was a member of the Marlins on, that, on their World Series, their first World Series championship winning team. Uh, yeah, huge year from Kevin Brown there in 98. And then the other kind of star pitcher that they've had in this time period, Jake Peavy in 07, he was a Cy Young winner as he went 19 and six when he led the league in wins and ERA is ERA 2.54. Also led the league in strikeouts, FIP, whip and strikeouts per nine. He struck out 240 guys, good for 9.7 strikeouts per nine. Uh, great competitor out there was Peavy. Yeah, I used to love watching him pitch. He just seemed angry the whole time. <laughs> yeah. at people and just really aggressive. I loved it. Then uh, Andrew Kashner in 2013, he went 10-9, and nine, but his ERA was 3.09. And Tyson Ross in 2015, uh, worth four wins. Uh, he had a, his ERA was about three and a quarter, but he only went 10-12. and 12. I'll blame that on, I'm, I'm guessing, poor run support there from the pods. Uh, he led the league in starts, also led the league in, in walks and wild pitches. <laughs> um, but he did strike out 9.7 guys per nine, had 212 strikeouts. Um, so, yeah, that's the rotation I've got. Uh, any brief thoughts on the rotation? Yeah, I mean, I see the numbers for Tyson Ross. I don't recall him being stellar. <laughs> but – uh yeah, I mean, he was in that time period of the Padres where they were perennially rebuilding. Um, but, 
yeah, I think the run support wasn't there, but yeah, I guess he was he was decent. The other guys I all recognize and remember as key pitchers over the years. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a good rotation. And then now, think, sorry, just real quick, I think the other um, thing that we might be struggling with a little bit here is again the concentration of starting pitching. Like on that '98 team, um, they were stacked that year, and it might be trying to piece together a roster here and missed out on a few of those big seasons. Yeah. And then as we move to the bullpen, that's been a strength of the Padres for several years. Uh, so we'll start it off in 02. I've got Steve Reed. He had a sub two ERA um, across just 41 innings, but he struck out. So he struck out 36 and 41. Uh, so not huge numbers there, but he, he kept the runs off the board. Uh, Rod Beck in 03, he also had a sub-2 ERA. He saved 20 games for the pods there. Uh, his ERA plus of 224. And then Trevor Hoffman in 06, he knew he was going to be on this roster at some point. It was just going to be a matter of which year. He was worth 2.1 wins that year. He led the league in saves at 46. Um, he had a 2.14 ERA. Uh, across 63 innings. Um, he was an all-star that year. Uh, I've got Mike Adams from 08. He is ERA about two and a half, uh, 65 and a third innings in, in 54 appearances, so he can get you more than three outs. Um, Heath Bell, who followed in uh, Hoffman's footsteps as the Padres' closer, I believe. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I believe he was next. So I got Heath Bell in 2010. He had a sub two ERA, 1.93. He closed 47 games that year, uh, 70 innings, um, ERA plus of 191. So great year out of Heath Bell. He was an all-star that year. And then I got Fernando Rodney in 2016. Uh, and this was one of the rare guys who I picked on a roster who was actually traded midseason to a different team. Mm -hmm. There's a couple other players like um, I know CC Sabathia for the Brewers I put on who was traded to the Brewers and had that remarkable finish. Well, Fernando Rodney, I mean, he only threw 28 in two thirds innings, uh, but his ERA was microscopic 0.31. Uh, he struck out um, just over a batter or yeah, just over a batter an inning. Uh, so <laughs> you could not score off of him when he was with the Padres. I think it changed after he was traded. <laughs> so the Padres traded high on him, but he was filthy for them. And then finishing up in 2017, I've got the left-hander Brad Hand. Uh, he went three and four. He's worth three wins out of the pen, 79 in the third innings. He had 21 saves, um, 2.16 ERA. So that's uh, the bullpen I've got. So what do you think about this bullpen? A lot of closers. Yeah, it's uh, which yeah, is I mean, interesting, especially. Let's see, you've got them um, kind of in the early two thousands. Yeah, you got them up through the the recent years too. Um, but yeah, it seems like we've always had a relatively weak bullpen, but we've had strong closers. Um, so as long as we can get to that last inning and hold the lead, that's great. Um, of course, Trevor Hoffman. We have to talk about him. He is just an icon in San Diego. Probably one of the best spectacles in sports when he would come into a game and they would play Hell's Bells. I don't know if you ever had a chance to witness that, but it's just spine tingling. It's awesome. Whole stadiums jumping and what a way to warm up and then get to your first pitch. You're just jacked up. And then, yeah, then he throws that change up and you're out in front by a mile. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, one of the most effective pitches maybe ever, that changeup that he threw. Because he didn't have real high top speed. No, I mean, he, he didn't, didn't, yeah, which is kind of rare for a dominant yeah. closer. You think of closers just coming at you with a big fastball. And you know, he had a decent low mid-90s fastball, but then that changeup from the same arm slot was just devastating. <laughs> Yeah, so that's uh, that's what we've got. Again, now if, if any listeners, if this inspires you and you want to create a roster for either the Padres or perhaps another team, 
go ahead and visit the website, boxybanter.com. There is a, a link to download a Google spreadsheet for a template to create your own roster. So I would love to see any rosters that you create. And yeah, so submit those. Chris, you alluded to it earlier. You also made a Padres roster. So why don't you share with the listeners your roster? Absolutely. So uh, I think our position players came out really similar here. I'm looking correctly. We only have one difference. So uh, my two catchers, I had Nick Hunley and Rene Rivera in the same years as you. Um, Adrian Gonzalez, 09 year, had to be our first baseman. Same with Loretta at second, Caminiti at third, uh, Tatis Jr. at 19. I thought I was going out on a limb there. I was, <laughs> I was pleased to see you put him there too yep. because he had that partial season left midway with the injury but still put up some great numbers. Um, Reggie Sanders, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was an odd pick for me as a Padres fan because not one of the guys you think of as a as a Padre over the years, but definitely had a great year in 99. Um, Brian Giles, Tony Gwynn. Um, this is actually tough for me to go back and see Tony Gwynn in the twilight of his career. He had so many good years right before this window that we got, were limited to mm -hmm. for this quarter century team, but still a good year in 97. Um, Chase Headley's great year where he had both the Silver Slugger and the Gold Glove. Um, Bill Nevin was one of my infielders. We also had him. And then the one difference was I had um, Denorfia, Christian Norfia in 2013. He had um, 4.2 games, wins above replacement. And I had him instead of Hunter Renfro in the outfield. So that was where we differed. Uh, Ryan Klesko, I, like you, put him in the outfield rather than at first base. He fit in better in that position. Uh, yeah, that rounded out my position players. Yeah, so the way yeah, the one difference, as you mentioned, being Denorfia. Denorfia was definitely a more valuable player than Renfro, who I had. Uh, and Denorfia is just like, as playing against him, he was just like an annoying player, you know. He was, <laughs> he didn't seem like, you know, necessarily the most talented player, but he was just always like doing something to help the Padres win, it yeah. seemed like. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and then I think not much to talk about there since we had pretty much all the same guys <laughs> in the same year. So let's move on to the pitching. Um, I think my my starting rotation, pretty similar with the, the top three, Kevin Brown, Jake Peavy, Andy Ashby. Mm -hmm. um, Kevin Brown's big year was a no-brainer. Jake Peavy's Cy Young year, no-brainer. Andy Ashby actually had quite a few good years but he was also kind of um, difficult to fit in there with what we mentioned before, where we had that concentration of good players in the vicinity of that 98 World Series. So I ended up having to go back to 95, which you did as well, I think. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, you get a year that was good for him, but didn't conflict with anyone else's better year. Um, the one that I differed with you on, you had Andrew Kashner. I put Drew Pomeranz in there. His mm -hmm. 2016 year, one of our our newer pitchers who started out as a, a starting pitcher in the organization has since moved to the bullpen, has actually closed a couple games this year. Mm -hmm. um, so he's been really versatile, but had a great year in 2016 as a starting pitcher. Um, I also had Tyson Ross's 2015 season. And again, I think we talked about this. <laughs> I was surprised to see that he put up those numbers that year with my own recollection. Um, and again, lots of closers. Um, I had Brad Hand, as you did, Trevor Hoffman. Um, I had Trevor Hoffman's 06 season as well. Um, one that I have that you didn't have is more recent was Kirby Yates. His 2018 year had a pretty good year two years ago. Um, he fell. Um, Brandon Villafuerte, that was another difference we had as yeah. well. Um, yeah, I think more than anything, that was probably a pick to to fit in that year and the slot I had left and to make some room for some position players, but had a decent year in 0-2. Um, and then I had Mike Adams, 08, same as you. 
and it also had Prod Beck in there for O3. So yeah, lots of closers, a couple different closers, um, just speaks to how many good closers we had at the Padres. Yeah. Now you mentioned, you know, uh, how, how they had such a concentration of talent in certain years, especially that World Series team in 98. So who were some players that were unable to fit on either of our rosters? I mean, our rosters are so similar. So if they weren't on yours, chances are they were not on mine. So who are some of the guys who you felt like you wanted to get on there, but you just couldn't based on the years? Yeah, absolutely. I think the biggest one that pained me to leave off there was Greg Vaughn's 98 season. <laughs> that was, uh, yeah, my guess of where you're going with that one. The homers, yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, you just, you can't, you can't put him over Kevin Brown's monster year in 98. Yeah. And that was really his only big year with the Padres. And then mm -hmm. he was gone. And um, I, don't, I don't think he even had a year that big. And that might have been his career year. Yeah. Um, I'd have to go back and look. But, yeah, that was a tough one to leave off. And he didn't have any other years that came close to it while well, Padre. So mm -hmm. that was a tough one. Another one, just because I loved him as a player, was uh, Steve Finley. Yeah, um, I had him on my stellar just... outfielder and had some great years. But again, I think I put a note that his 96 year was one That's, of the <laughs> It's funny. I had that same note. Okay. Yeah. And then who did we end up putting in 96? We put, oh, that's Caminiti's MVP year. He yeah, so, that. yeah. <laughs> so but yeah, and he had a number of good years and it was just couldn't find, find a spot to slot him in there. Steve Finley, actually, remember he played for all five NL West teams. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's a, I don't know if that's a claim to fame or a dubious honor. <laughs> But yeah, so yeah, I had him also in, in 96 as somebody who I was unable to get on there. Anybody else who you missed out on? Um, other position players, a couple other ones that I, I know I was tinkering with trying to slot in there was uh, Justin Upton, mm. his short tenure with the Padres. He had a good year in 2015. Um, and also Will Myers, mm -hmm. one of those big contracts we talked about. <laughs> Had a, a good year in 2016. Went to the All Star Game when it was in San Diego. It was a great representative for the Padres when they hosted it in San Diego. Um, <laughs> just a fun guy, but he actually had a really good year that year too. Yeah, I had. Oh, go on. No, that's it. Go for it. I had a couple other guys that I had who was unable to get on there. Were uh, Piazza and Mike oh, yeah. Cameron. Piazza and Mike Cameron both had good years in '06. Um, I think we both took Trevor Hoffman that year. And then when you talk about, you know, <laughs> the years overlapping, Hoffman had a huge year in 98. Yeah. That was his best year. But again, you got to take Kevin Brown that year. Uh, the funny thing was, I think Hoffman finished second in Cy Young voting in 98, and Kevin Brown was third. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so um, well, that, that was, was – how many – I don't have it in front of me, but how many saves did Hoffman have in 98? That was his big year, right? Yeah, 98, he – 53, which led the league, and that was his career high. I mean, his ERA was one and a half. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, huge year. He was worth, I think, like four wins. Yeah, 4.1 wins. So, that was his best year. Uh, 96 was another huge year from him. But, again, we just mentioned, you know, Steve Finley had a great year, and that was Caminiti's MVP year. Um, and this may did, be the – this may be the bitter Padre fan in me, but um, the only thing I remember about Hoffman's 98 year was the save he blew in game three of the World Series. <laughs> he hadn't like blown a save all year, and then he blew that one. That was so heartbreaking. He did in the year that we got him in 06. He did finish second in the Cy Young uh, voting that year and 10th oh, in the MVP voting. Nice. So, yeah, we do have that. So, um that was everyone who I had. And the other guy who I was unable to get on my roster was Kirby Yates. You got him on yours. Um, and, and he's been another great reliever for the Padres. Um, if our listeners, if you want to point out any other mistakes, if you want to critique our rosters, um, you know, go ahead, find us on Twitter. Again, it's at Boxy Banter, both on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I'd love to hear 
the uh, criticisms and maybe some of the praise as well for putting these rosters together. <laughs> About constructive feedback. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's the professor in you, right? That's right. <laughs> It's time for the Q&A segment, and we open it up on Twitter and Instagram for questions from our listeners about each team each week. So make sure to follow on Twitter and Instagram at Foxy Banter on both of those platforms. We've got a few questions that came in for the Padres. Uh, a couple questions from Chris Kirk uh, asking questions out of Texas. His first question was, has there ever been a Hall of Fame player in baseball mean more to a franchise than Tony Gwynn? And, you know, being in, in San Diego, you mentioned how he was always generous with his time, signing autographs for everybody, uh, you know, a, a pillar of the community. So you saw that firsthand. Do you think anybody can compete with him? You know, I mean, he was Mr. Padre. Such a yeah. – I mean – Short answer, no. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I don't have anything to reference against, but, man, he is just a, a stalwart in San Diego. I mean, you mentioned talking about him that he came up through the Aztecs, so from collegiate sports all the way through being professional with the Padres, and he was – I mean, that is such a rarity in this day and age that people have that long of a career – with one team yeah. and continue to play at such a high level. I mean, he had a ridiculous number of batting titles and consecutive all-star games. I mean, he was just at the top of the game for so long and he managed to stay with a small market team that entire time. It's really something you probably will never see again. And then the when he, when he finished, changed. when he finished playing, he uh, yeah. was the coach of the San Diego state baseball team. Coach of San Diego state Aztecs. He was part of the broadcast team for the Padres after that. I mean, he was involved in San Diego through and through. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff all over San Diego named after him. It's, I, I mean, his son is now part of the broadcast team. It's like that family is just entrenched in San Diego and, People still talk about Tony Gwynn with a, you can't not talk about him and just have a smile come to your face. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> All right. So uh, the answer that we got for, has there ever been a Hall of Fame baseball player mean more to a franchise than Tony Gwynn? The answer is no. Maybe a listener from who's a fan or ha has more knowledge about other teams can chime in with an argument for somebody else. But yeah, you make a great point that Tony Gwynn means more to the Padres than anybody else means to their individual franchise we've got another question from chris kirk and and this one may bring up some bad memories as well as some good memories what is your favorite win as a padre fan as well as your most heartbreaking loss yeah let's start with the loss that one's easy <laughs> i think we talked about it earlier the the matt holiday slide against right. the rocky playing game that was just brutal um because that was the difference in the game and it was wrong and they didn't have the capacity at the time to go back and fix it. So it was just brutal because we had instant replay. We could watch it be wrong, mm -hmm. but we couldn't change it. Right. <laughs> and then um, I guess my favorite one is one that didn't happen in my lifetime, but being raised in a, a Padres household my parents were season ticket holders. Uh, as you mentioned before, I went to the 84 World Series in my, my mom's womb. Um, but in that NLCS that year, Padres were playing the Cubs and uh, Steve Garvey hit a walk-off homer um, that has gone down in Padres lore. And I've heard about it a million times from my parents. I've seen the video a million times. So I think that's, that's probably up there on the list of best Padres games, Padres moments ever. Yeah, and I mean, as with with all sports, you know, it, it's the, those losses are, you know, because how often, you know, only one team gets to win the final game. So those losses are easier to remember than, uh, but there's more of them since you so rarely are, are the the ultimate winner. So unfortunately, those ones are easier to yeah. identify. <laughs> Well, I could also, I have one that's actually really fresh recent history too. That's actually a series of games that we haven't talked about yet either. But the Padres just had four games in a row 
where they hit grand slams. That's one of right. them was a walk-off grand slam by Manny Machado. So that's while that's not a single game, that was a feat that I doubt will ever be repeated. Yeah, I mean, I wonder how many times teams have even had bases loaded opportunities in four yeah. straight games. I mean, it's not, you know, that doesn't happen every day. And they got those opportunities for four straight games. And yeah. wow, to hit grand slams in four straight yeah. games, unbelievable. Unbelievable. And then they actually hit another one two days later. Right. They ended up hitting five and six, which was, I, it was just been insane. I don't even know how to describe it. <laughs> And giving uh, giving the that city in Southern California and kind of renaming it as Slam Diego. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And our final question of this week comes from Terry Dewan, who was on the program earlier when we were discussing National League East teams. He asks, "What's the greatest iteration of the Padres uniform?" Ooh, and that's a good one. I'll let you think about that. But I wanted to point out as you kind of come up with your response that the Padres, as we know, just uh, this year, they've, they've gone back to their roots with the brown and yellow color scheme that uh, they've had so many iterations of their uniforms that I don't know if they still do, but um, about a decade ago, they provided uniforms to every little league in a 10 mile radius of Petco park. Because now, you know, Chris, when you were growing up playing Little League, like what, what team did you play on? Yeah. I was on the Dodgers and the Rockies and yeah. Not yeah, you're on a bunch of teams. Yeah, I was on, I played <laughs> on like the Pirates and the White yeah. Sox and all these other teams and the A's. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, I was in LA, you're in San Diego and playing on these teams that are not our, you know, hometown team. Yeah. But the Padres were able to provide uniforms because what they did is they had so many different uniforms over the years. They'd be like, all right, this team is the 84 Padres. And this team is the 72 Padres. This team's the 98 Padres. And they were all different uniforms. I thought it was a phenomenal idea yeah. because so many kids, you know, they, they developed their fandom based on, you know, what little league team they played on. Absolutely. So now, instead of, you know, Bobby in San Diego, he plays for the Cardinals and he's a Cardinals fan. Well, now he's a plays on the, you know, the 98 Padres and he's looking up Kevin Brown and Trevor Hoffman and he's yeah. developing Padres fandom. So yeah, absolutely. It was a stroke of marketing. <laughs> yeah. Not every team is capable of doing that, but the Padres are, and it was a great idea. So yeah. with, with all those uniforms to choose from, what do you think is your favorite? I am so for a long time I've always been a fan of the brown and mustard they're kind of old school throwback ones they've always kind of mixed in a throwback here and there as an alternate uni or whatever um, so I'm really excited about the new ones and I'm exceptionally excited about the new ones because I think my second favorite was when they were in the navy and orange mm -hmm. but they had the pinstripes <laughs> and so that was like I want to say mid to late 90s if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so now we have the combination of the brown and mustard with the pinstripes. So we got the white pinstripes and we got the road pinstripes. So I think I have to say for my final answer, the new ones, because they're a combo of all my favorite <laughs> things from the old ones. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, I think I've seen an argument or something like our, our favorite things are always when we're like around like in the 10 to 14 age range. Yep. And so, yeah, <laughs> but that was, yeah, maybe have uh, uh, inspired your um, answer to that question. I, I mean, I, I, I love the current uniforms that they have. They are, um, they're different, you know, like there's so many teams that have certain color, but nobody's, you know, got that, that brown and yellow color scheme. Yeah. So it, it is different. It, it's, you know, it, it's, only theirs, you know, you, you see this, how many teams have, have red or have this, you know, that, right. but so yeah. it, it is nice to, to have an identity that is, you know, all theirs. So that's what I would, I mean, I'm not a Padres fan, didn't grow up with that, but I, I agree. I like those ones a lot too. Yeah. They're pretty solid. And if I could add one thing too, to your, your Padres little league uniforms, they send out, if you go online they have some shots of like, 
opening day of those little leagues and it's awesome when they're all lined up with all the different uniforms over the years kind of like a walk through history that's great all right and again remember for to follow on twitter and instagram to make sure to get uh questions that you have uh answered on the program chris it's time to grade the rosters now both of our rosters are, are very similar we'll stick with uh just grading mine right now Although after you grade it, maybe you can make an argument for why yours is better than mine. Right. Uh, but what are some of the strengths and weaknesses of the Padres roster that I've assembled, do you think? And yeah, how would you grade it? Yeah, I think we kind of talked about this earlier, but um, not a ton of power, but a lot of good average, got some pretty good doubles numbers over the years too for the position players. So, you know, a good hitting, but not for power team. <laughs> I think that's a good way to sum them up. We had a couple power guys in there, Caminiti, Giles. Well, Giles didn't have a good year of the year, good power year of the year. You had him, more of a doubles guy. But more guys like Tony Gwynn, Mark Loretta. Um, yeah, I guess we got Adrian Gonzalez, had some dingers. But yeah, in general, not the, the most power hitting team and then what about the pitchers pitchers I mean I think starting pitching kind of captured lightning in a bottle here that I don't think is uh representative of the Padres over this entire period but Kevin Brown's monster year Jake Peavy's Cy Young year you ended up having to take not Andy Ashby's best year and it was still a great year um and then we talked about just Lots and lots of saves because we got lots and lots of closers, um, big strikeout numbers per innings um, because they're closers because they had some nasty stuff. Um, yeah, so I think in general, decent starting pitching for the top three. Then it kind of falls off pretty drastically. Lots of closers. And then I think we use the rest of the relief pitchers to kind of fill in the gaps. <laughs> kind of didn't have some, some stronger ones at the bottom of the relief pitching there. All right, so what do you think on a grade for this team? How would they compete against my other quarter century rosters? Hmm. My guess would be they're somewhere low middle to bottom. <laughs> So oh, I'd say, are we doing letter grades? Yeah, letter grade. Okay. C minus. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think you're spot on with a lot of your stuff. I agree. You know, the, the rate stats are pretty good. You mentioned, you know, they, they hit for some good averages. Uh, yeah, so those rate stats are there. They're actually, um, you know, upper half. And, you know, as a team, they hit 302, get on base at a 385 clip. Uh, and, and those are, you know, in the top half, um, they don't strike out a lot that they're above average there, but yeah, as you mentioned, their power numbers are really down, uh, just 320 home runs. We really could have used those 50 that Greg Vaughn had. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So the, the average is there, but yeah, not, not, not great power numbers below, you know, everywhere else are kind of below average and defensively, they're not the greatest either. Uh, their ERA is good, as well as their strikeout numbers, as you mentioned. Um, but the starters, yeah, after after Brown and PV and, and Ashby, you know, I would like more out of the starting pitchers there. Um, you know, and, and you know, you kind of associate pitching with the Padres, and I was kind of disappointed that I couldn't get another couple really good starters there. Um, but the bullpen is very good as a as a unit. Their ERA is 1.98, so sub two ERA out of the bullpen. I know ERA is not the best measure for relievers, but yeah, they kept the runs off the board and a lot of lot of guys to to close with. Who would you? I mean, I guess you got to give the ball to Hoffman, you know, in the yeah. ninth inning, right? He's the Hall of Famer. Um, and who would you? Who if it's Game Seven in in a series? Who would you give the ball to to start? I think I mentioned it earlier. I just love watching Jake Peavy pitch. So I mean, you give it to him over Brown? Uh, I might, just because the competitor in that playoff situation, 
I mean, I, I think I'd give it to PV. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so the, I think the, 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 the bullpen is a strength of this team. The outfield's kind of weak, even with Gwynn, as we mentioned. It, it was later in his career. He wasn't as dynamic of a player at that point in his career. Because, uh, yeah, in, in his younger days, he was a good defender. He would steal bases. At this point, he was uh, not as dynamic. He still got a bunch of hits. But little else, the catchers are kind of weak. The infield's all right. Um, you know, Tatis is not the, the you know, is his first year. So, yeah, overall, I got to give these guys an F, unfortunately. Oh. Oh. <laughs> uh, really? Yeah, it's tough, you know, I mean, because, you know, other teams, they, they are, sometimes some teams are able to stack like five legitimate aces in there. So it's, it's some tough competition. Uh, you know, if we're doing this in 10 years, you know, the Padres, it, it could be very different because you've got right. a full year of Tatis, you got Machado in there, you've got mm -hmm. somebody like Chris Paddock. And Chris Paddock, by the way, I think he's the one who came over in that trade with uh, for Fernando Rodney. Ah, okay. That yeah. Was good. Yeah. yeah. So, and I, I know they've got some other young arms there um, who are just waiting to be called up, but... Yeah, and I mean, I think it shows, you know, they've had those couple stretches. But, yeah, that's what I give it. I give them an F. Um, Padre fans, if you disagree, uh, I I'm, disagree. Willing, I'm willing to hear it. <laughs> uh, yeah, but so that's what, that's what I've got. Man, do you have other teams that had an F? Uh, yeah, I forget who. I know the um, – there, there's been some other teams that had lower grades as well. Off the top of my head, I can't. Uh, remember which ones but I don't think, think of anybody worse than the Padres uh the Pirates I think we're Pirates we're, we're down there um the the Reds were down there I don't know if they're as low but I think the Pirates got an F um so yeah I mean it's uh I don't know you're you're the you, you grade more more than I do so you would know <laughs> Um, yeah, constructive feedback <laughs> but I yeah I did give the the Pirates an F as well uh yeah I don't know I don't know the, the grading curve how that works how many <laughs> how many F's do you give out of 30 teams yeah uh you know they <laughs> give a handful like two or three yeah so yeah unfortunately the Padres are one of those but yeah if you've got other other thoughts again uh, um the, the inbox is open <laughs> Chris, as we finish up here, it's time to share our final thoughts. So I'll let you go first. What are your final thoughts on the Padres, on their organization? Uh, anything you want to share? Sure. So I guess I'll start with, you know, it's been kind of a rocky road as a kid growing up as a Padres fan. Learned to be disappointed, but we've had our couple bright spots. And I think we're moving into an era here where we'll have many bright years ahead of us here. I think they've actually kind of taking the time to assemble a farm system that's going to continue to produce talent. Whereas before we talked about this with the rosters where, you know, it was build up a team, get as far as you can, make the road series and then fire sale it. I mean, kind of similar to what the Marlins did when you were talking about them in your previous podcast. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about the future. I think this 25 year period was a tough one to assemble a team with. Um, but I think we have bright things ahead. The other thing that we didn't touch on in any of our segments here that I wanted to bring up was the Padres relationship with the military. So people who have watched baseball probably have seen on occasion Padres wearing their camo unis. And they, Again, yeah, they, back, back to the uniforms. Back to the unis, that's right. <laughs> another one to put in the mix. Um, but they, they really formalized that in, I'd say, maybe the past decade or so. And um, on Sundays, they do their military tribute, and they always wear their camo unis, whether on the road or at home. I think that's been a really cool thing that they've done, because the military has a big presence in San Diego. We have Marine bases, Coast Guard bases, Navy bases. And so on those Sunday games, it's always cool that they'd always bring the new recruits at the Marine Corps Recruit Depot and they put them all in a section in their uniforms. And in the fourth inning, they'd get up and, and sing their hymn or their military song. 
and it's always kind of a cool spectacle at the games. So that's something that just really sticks out to me. And um, we were talking about the the uniforms and um, how that was probably a stroke of marketing genius to get all the local San Diego kids to wear San Diego uniforms and be lifelong San Diego fans. Uh, they do the same thing with the military. They have these guys fresh into the Marines. They give them free tickets to the game. And I think they also, um, they do something in the Navy. I think they like send game tapes or something to the ships. And so they're trying to make all the, the Navy guys out on the, out serving out on the ocean become Padre fans too. So <laughs> really cool relationship, really cool how they tribute um, and pay homage to the military, um, not just on the big holidays, but every Sunday. Yeah, and yeah, you bring a great point. I know some some of the stuff that that uh, you know baseball player teams wear on certain holidays, as well as other sports. Uh, yeah, it seems very forced, and it's like mm -hmm. ah, I mean, it seems like a way to sell jerseys and stuff like that. But right. the way that the Padres do it, yeah, it's very organic and natural with that military history there in San Diego. So yeah, it's a very nice thing that they do with the community down there. Um, yeah. And, and as we wrap up here, I would just like to say, I mean, we've been talking about it um, throughout, but yeah, they've had those couple stretches in the past 25 years, uh, that 98 world series team, as well as the uh, 05 and 06 and into 07 as they lost that tiebreaker game. Those were the two kind of windows that they've had, uh, but they haven't been able to sustain anything. They have had recently, they've made a bunch of splashy stuff, and that hasn't worked either with, you know, the Matt, Matt Kemp trade, as you mentioned, the Hosmer and Myers signings, stuff like that has not worked. But now they've acquired young talent through trades, through the draft, through international free agent signings, and they've got a lot of nice young talent there. We mentioned Tatis. Um, they've got Paddock, who was not on this roster, but he's somebody who they hope to anchor their rotation for several years. Um, they've got a couple other guys. Um, yeah, we got a strong Rookie of the Year candidate, too, in Corona. Oh, yeah. Another guy who came over, he came over from Tampa in that trade, right? He did, yeah, with yeah. FAM. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, he, he's been a great player this year for them. Um, and they've got, who's that? Is it Patino or what's that reliever's name? I know this year he's, he hasn't been great so far, but he's, he's young. Got good stuff. I mean, he's just a little unpolished. He'll get and, there. And they've got, I think, uh, Mackenzie Gore in the minors. Yep. Yep. Um, there, there might be another pitcher in the minors who I'm, I can't. Yeah, think Mackenzie Gore is like routinely in top five, top 10 prospects. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the future, just like the weather in San Diego, is bright. Uh, I think that, you know, they are, you know, it, recently it's been tough to contend with the Dodgers there. Um, and, you know, not counting this year when half the team makes the playoffs. Uh, you know, they've obviously got a great shot this year. Yeah. Um, more than halfway through, it looks like they, they should get in the playoffs and who knows what happened in the playoffs. But once we get a full real season, I think that, you know, they're going to be a team that can contend with all that young talent and they might be able to do it for several years. So I think, you know, in the past 25 years, this roster gets an F, but in the future, their outlook is much brighter. And yeah, hopefully, you know, we can – get back to watching baseball, we can go down there at Petco Park and, you know, watch a game and one of the best ballparks in baseball with a lot of talent on the field. Let's go watch, uh, you know, Mookie Betts and Cody Bellinger play against Tatis and Machado and Gore yeah. and Paddock. Yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to that. Grandkids about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, Chris, it's been a joy to have you on the program to discuss the Padres. I know, uh, you know, growing up in San Diego, the Padres are, are just, you know, the team to be a fan of. We mentioned they're the only team now in San Diego. But, um, you know, uh, with guys that you mentioned, uh, Gonzalez and Gwyn growing up in San Diego and, and being members there, it's got to be great rooting for them throughout. So it's, it's been great to have you on a San Diego native to discuss the Padres. Um, and yeah, so thank you for joining. 
Um, this is Billy Ballas of Box Seed Banter signing off.